Welcome to an introduction to managerial accounting, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. In this podcast, we continue the analysis of financial statements by looking at ratio analysis. Why should we be interested in ratios? Managers are interested because they provide further information to see if targets were met, whether vendors can maintain supplies, whether customers are going to be able to pay, and whether to invest in another company. Investors are interested because the ratios help in making decisions about whether to invest or withdraw investment from a business. The first set of ratios we shall consider are referred to as the profitability ratios. They include earnings per share, price earnings ratios, gross margin percentage, the return on total assets, and the return on stockholders' equity. To carry out calculations of ratios, we need financial information. This will come from the balance sheets for the two previous years, and from the income statements for the two previous years. We start with earnings per share. For the purpose of this podcast, we are assuming that each share had a value of $1 and that there has been no payment of a preferred dividend. The balance sheet then indicates that we have 45,000 shares. To make the calculation, we take net income, less preferred dividends, and then divide by the number of shares. The figures for net income are taken from the income statements. For 2012, the figure was $81,375, and for 2011, the figure was $51,750. The figures for common stock were derived from the balance sheet. For 2012, the earnings per share were $1.80, and for 2011, the earnings were $1.15. The earnings per share have increased. The next ratio is the price-earnings ratio. To determine this ratio we need an additional piece of information, that is the market price per share. This can be obtained from listings from the stock exchanges. The date for the market price should be the date of the balance sheet. In this case it was the last day of the calendar year. And for 2012 was $14 and for 2011 it was $10.50. Using these figures we calculate a ratio of 7.74 for 2012 and a ratio of 9.13 for 2011, showing a small fall in the ratio. The gross margin percentage is determined by dividing the gross margin by the net sales. It represents an estimate of the incremental profit generated by each dollar of sales. All the information that we require for gross margin percentage is obtained from the income statements. The relevant figures are shown highlighted. The gross margin percentage was 0.312 in 2012 and 0.325 in 2011. There has been very little change in this ratio. The return on total assets is obtained by adjusting the net income for interest expense net of taxes and then dividing this revised total by the total assets. For the purpose of calculation the tax rate was assumed at 25%, but remember tax rates vary and the correct tax rate at the time must be used. The information that we require is obtained from the income statements and is shown highlighted here. The ratio shows a substantial increase from 0.299 in 2011 to a value of 0.496 in 2012. This can be considered to be a healthy sign. Finally in this section the return on stockholders equity. The net income less any preferred dividends is divided by the common stockholders equity. The figures from the income statement have been highlighted as have the figures that we shall need from the balance sheet. The ratio shows a small increase, 
from 0.837 in 2011 to a value of 0.886 in 2012. An important consideration is the financial leverage of a business. This looks at the amount of the assets of the business that is being financed by debt as opposed to equity. Two important ratios here are the return on total assets and the return on stockholders' equity. Here the return on equity is greater than the return on assets. The next section of ratios is the turnover ratios, which give an indication of the efficient use of the assets. The ratios comprise the asset turnover, accounts receivable turnover and days sales in receivables, the inventory turnover and day sales in inventory. The asset turnover ratio is calculated by dividing the net sales by the total assets. Higher ratios show a more efficient use of assets. Figures for net sales are obtained from the income statements and the figures for total assets from the balance sheets. The calculations show an improvement from 2.277 in 2011 to 3.487 in 2012. To determine the accounts receivable turnover we are going to assume that all sales are being made as credit sales and that there are no cash sales. Whilst this is fine for many businesses it would not really be applicable to a supermarket where almost all sales are likely to be made on a cash basis. To obtain the ratio we divide net credit sales by the figure for accounts receivable. The figures for the sales will come from the income statements. The figures for receivables are obtained from the balance sheets. The accounts receivable ratio has fallen from 14.77 in 2011 to 10.60 in 2012. The ratio becomes more significant when we use it to determine day's sales in receivables. In simple terms, this is a measure of how long the sales amount remains in receivables before the cash is obtained. In other words, how long will it be before the customer pays? So we use the accounts receivable turnover figures. We divide this into 365 days. The figures now show us a red flag. The ratio for 2011 showed an average of almost 25 days before payment for sales made was received. In 2012 it had risen to 34 days. Since most businesses will only offer credit for 30 days, these figures suggest there is a real problem to be addressed here. The inventory turnover is obtained by dividing the cost of goods sold by the figure for inventory. Figures for the cost of goods sold are obtained from the income statements. And figures for inventory are obtained from the balance sheets. As a result of the fall in inventory there has been a considerable change here. The figure has risen from 20.2 in 2011 to 98.17 in 2012. The ratio we have just determined plays a part in the day's sales are in inventory. This is determined by dividing 365 days by the inventory turnover ratio. The longer this period, the longer goods remain in inventory before being sold, and the greater the amount that is tied up in this asset. The figure has fallen from 18.07 days in 2011 to 3.80 days in 2012. Whilst this is healthy because it shows there is no build-up of goods in inventory, it also offers a flag. Is the business going to continue to meet demand for customers? And if payments for these goods is taking over 30 days, then further problems could well develop. The last set are the debt-related ratios. These ratios are concerned with the amount of debt that a company has and the ability of the company to repay that debt. The ratios comprise the current ratio, the acid test or quick ratio, the debt to equity ratio and the times interest earned ratio. 
To obtain the current ratio, we divide current assets by current liabilities. This gives an indication of whether the company can meet the current obligations. Clearly, the value has to be one or higher for this to occur. All the information that we are going to use is obtained from the balance sheets. For 2011 the figure was 3.32 and for 2012 the figure has fallen to 2.42. However, both these are in excess of 1 so the company can meet current liabilities. A measure often used instead of current ratio is the acid test or quick ratio. The quick refers to only considering those assets that are very easily turned to cash. So cash itself, marketable securities, and receivables. Inventory is not considered since this means selling goods and obtaining cash. You don't know how long the sale is going to take. A ratio of less than one could indicate difficulties. The figures that we require are obtained from the balance sheets. The figures reveal a small increase from 1.90 in 2011 to 2.25 in 2012. Both are above 1, which we can regard as healthy. The debt to equity ratio is obtained by dividing the total liabilities by the stockholder's equity. The higher this ratio, the greater the debt is. High ratios mean greater risks, and the company may find it difficult to obtain further financing if this ratio is high. The figures that we require are obtained from the balance sheets. The figure has fallen from 2.13 in 2011 to 1.05 in 2012. This fall in the ratio can be considered as a healthy sign. Finally, the times interest earned, which is obtained by dividing operating income by the interest expense. Higher ratios indicate greater health and greater likelihood that the company can meet debt payments. The figures required are obtained from the income statements. There has been a fall from 9.63 in 2011 to 7.78 in 2011. Although operating income has increased, so has interest expense. This might signal an area to watch. This ends our podcast on the use of ratios to help analyse financial statements. Brought to you by Parkman's tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.